Hello, Rewatch Podcast listeners, and thank you for joining us for this special bonus episode of the Rewatch Podcast. I just wanted to say, before we get into this episode, that we sat down and recorded this episode earlier in the week, and of course, now we have heard the tragic news that we have lost Alan Rickman at the age of 69. He has passed away. So I just wanted to say thank you for everything and dedicate this episode to his memory because he has provided us with so much entertainment over the years from movies like Die Hard, uh, the Harry Potter films, Love Actually, the list goes on and of course this film here that we're discussing today, Galaxy Quest. So let's all just have a moment of silence for Alan Rickman. All right guys, thank you and enjoy this special bonus episode. In the far reaches of the galaxy, a civilization is under siege. We are all that is left. They've searched the universe for a leader. Stay tuned for scenes from next week's Galaxy Quest. Never give up. Never surrender. You will save us. What they got... Never give up and never surrender. ...were struggling TV actors. You are our last hope. Where's my limo? <laughs> Okie dokie. And they're about to put on a command performance. Eight million light years away. We are actors, not astronauts. You are our protectors. That was a hell of a thing. Now, Laredo, take us out. You gotta move to the right. Would you sit your ass down? You wanna drive this to... Acting like heroes. The whole thing was just a misunderstanding. May not be enough. They look like little children. Hi, little guy. Oh, man. DreamWorks Pictures presents Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, Alan Rickman, Galaxy Quest. You're just gonna have to kill him. We'll go for the mouth, the throat, his vulnerable spots. It's a rock, it doesn't have any vulnerable spots. The Rewatch Podcast presents The Galaxy Quest Rewatch A bonus episode discussion for the Star Trek film series Rewatch Send your thoughts to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com Join us at our Facebook page facebook.com slash rewatch podcast and follow us on Twitter at Rewatch Pod Today we're discussing Galaxy Quest, starring Tim Allen, Sigourney Weaver, Alan Rickman, Tony Shalhoub, Sam Rockwell, Daryl Mitchell, Enrico Colatoni, Missy Pyle, and Justin Long, directed by Dean Pariso. Welcome back to the Rewatch Podcast. I'm Corey. And the Grabtars are more <laughs> water savings. And uh, this is Nathan, and I'm not even supposed to be here. I'm just crewman number six. I'm expendable. That's true. I've always said that about you. I know. (laughs) Isn't that both of those lines? They're such great lines, aren't they? I do love this movie. It is a great movie. Welcome back, Corey. I know. We're back. A bonus episode. So much has happened. Star Trek rewatch. So much has happened since we last talked, like life wise, if you know what I mean. It's been busy, man. It has. It really has. But that's okay. Uh, It's all good. We're back now. And uh, yes. We're we're here to to, to do a bit of a. uh, bit of a bonus episode, a bit of a surprise episode. Yes, well, we did announce over on our Facebook and Twitter and all that that we're going to do another series rewatch, a film film rewatch for Police Academy. Mm-hmm. All seven films, we're going to talk about them all. So why not 
ease our way into doing a bit of comedy by sort of transitioning from sci-fi to comedy with Galaxy Quest. And like this is the best bridging episode between those two genres because it, it's absolutely linked Star Trek to Police Academy in some regards. <laughs> in a way. In a, in a way, from a comedy perspective, you're right. Exactly, yeah. So let's get into it. What is your history with Galaxy Quest? Um, my history with this film, it came out in 1999, so I was 22, 23 when it came out. I think I would have been right into my Star Trek um, science fiction phase. I remember it came out and it was a bit of a curious watch, and I remember liking it, man. I've, I, I've always liked this movie. When you mentioned to me a while ago that you wanted to take on Galaxy Quest, I thought, right. This is a this is actually a good move. This is this this is definitely a great film. But yeah, I, I remember kind of as I said, it came out in '99, and it it quickly became a cult classic. So yeah, so so that's kind of kind of my history. For me, as I've said throughout the the Star Trek rewatch, I kind of came to Star Trek pretty late in the game. So this movie kind of never really caught my interest at all. I knew what it was about. I knew that it was kind of spoofing Star Trek and Star Trek fandom and all that. But not having been into Star Trek, I was kind of just like, okay, I don't need to see that. But then when I did get into Star Trek, and I've seen so much Star Trek now, I had to see this as well. So I saw this back when I first started getting into Star Trek, maybe a few years after it came out. I think this is one of those films too that as you kind of discover cinema and movies a lot more, especially when you look at the cast, I mean, it's actually quite a good cast that that's in this film. I mean, I mean Tim Allen, so you could take him or leave him, but I think he does a pretty good job in this film. Um, Sigourney Weaver, Alan Rickman, Tony Shalhoub, Sam Rockwell, Missy Pyle, Justin Long, like, like these are all pretty very quality actors and, and to actually kind of get them into a, like an ensemble piece, I mean it should spike your interest simply from the cast. You know? Exactly, yeah, looking back on it now, of course, you know, you, you have the big ones, Tim Allen and, and Sigourney Weaver, like they're the ones that you're going to recognise, uh, I guess to an extent. Um, I think Alan Rickman Alan for Rick sure, well. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, he was... Um, <laughs> he was in Die Hard and all that, so he was pretty big by 99. Wasn't he in Robin Hood as well or something like that? Yeah, and that's that... right. Yeah, he was the sheriff. In... Was it Prince of Thieves? Was it the Kevin Costner one? Yeah, Is that right? Kevin yeah. Oh, my God. I can't believe I remember that. That, 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 <laughs> <laughs> that, that film, that was huge when that came out. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. but beyond that, yeah, you know, you see the cast and you're just like, oh, my God, like all these people are so big now that it's interesting that they all came together and did this uh, this movie back in the day. That's right. Um, shall we get into the synopsis, Corey? Okay, so the sci-fi television series Galaxy Quest takes place aboard the intergalactic spaceship NSEA Protector, and it stars Jason Nesmith as a suave commander Peter Quincy Taggart, Gwen DeMarco as sexy communications person Lieutenant Tawny Madison, a role which consists solely of her repeating what the computer states, much to Gwen's annoyance, Shakespearean trained Sir Alexander Dane as alien Dr. Lazarus, Fred Kwan as engineer Tech Sergeant Chen, and Tony Webber as child gunner Laredo. 18 years after the series last aired, it lives on in the hearts of its rabid fans. However, it lives on in infamy in its stars who have not been able to find meaningful acting work since the series' cancellation. Their current lives revolve around cashing in on however those roles will afford, which usually entails attending fan conventions and shopping mall openings. Only Jason seems to relish his lot in life until he finds out that his co-stars detest him because of his superior attitude and much of the public consider him a laughing stock. Their lives change when Jason is approached by who he thinks are convention fans asking for help. They are, in reality, an alien race called Thermians, led by Mathazar, who have modelled their existence on the series, which they believe to be historical documents. Jason and the rest of his co-stars, along with Guy Flegman, who was killed off before the first commercial break in only one episode, go along with the Thermians. They learn that they have to portray their roles for real. Without screenwriters to get them to a happy and heroic ending, they have to trust that their acting will help them operate the ship, especially when dealing with the Thermians' nemesis, General Saris, who is seeking the undefined device 
known only as Omega-13. Guy, in particular, fears that he will go the way of his character on the series. During their first battle with Saris, the ill-equipped team irreparably damages the ship, forcing them to a nearby planet to acquire beryllium. While there, they are faced with a vicious pixie-like alien and find themselves rising to the task by remembering old episodes and working as a team. However, the ship takes off on autopilot and Jason is left behind to face off against a rock monster while Fred attempts to work the transporter without turning Jason inside out. Fred gains his courage through his love for a Thermian named Lalieri, and upon learning that the Thermian's crew are all that's left of their race, the cast of actors vow to end their fight with Saris once and for all, which comes sooner than expected when they find that Saris has boarded the ship and taken Mathazar captive. Under duress, Jason is forced to explain what actors are, lying being a new concept to the Thermians. Saris starts a core overload, and begin suffocating the Thermians, so Jason and Alexander release a lot of built-up tension between each other by fighting as a distraction. Luckily, at one point, Jason accidentally swapped communicators with a Galaxy Quest fan named Brandon, who brings the geek community together to help guide Jason and Gwen through the ship using online specs. Along their path, they discover the Omega-13 device, and Brandon explains that many fan theories believe it to be a time delay, sending the user 13 seconds back in time. Alexander heads off and saves the Thermians, while Guy and Fred teleport the rock monster onto the bridge to take care of Saris's crew, leading to a gross makeout scene between Fred and Lalieri. Alexander loses a man in battle, allowing him to deliver his signature line with more passion than he has in years. Jason and Gwen cancel the core overload with 20 seconds to spare, but the countdown continues. Thinking they are going to die, they almost reveal their love for each other, but then the countdown stops at one second, just as it always does in the show. Tommy pilots the ship through a magnetic minefield, and they drag the mines back to Sarish's ship, destroying it. Before the crew can return to Earth, Jason names Mathazar the new crew commander when Saris appears on deck and murders the entire crew. Jason activates the Omega-13, sending him 13 seconds back in time where he stops Saris' attack with the help of Mathazar. Brandon helps guide the crashing NESA protector back to Earth where it crashes into the convention center and the crew emerges to fan applause. Saris appears for one last fight and Jason kills the alien commander with a single shot. The entire crew take a bow and and we cut to the opening credits of a brand new season of Galaxy Quest. 18 years later. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, well done, man. Thank you. There should be, I reckon we should put a sound effect in there of like an audience clapping or something like that. But of course, uh, to get through that, that was, uh, that was interesting. You did very well. It's actually, you know, for, for a comedy that sort of just is a parody of sci-fi fandom and stuff like that, it's it's a really complex outline when you think about it. Really, I'm, actually, it? I'm actually just trying to think of other science fiction comedies. They're reasonably rare. Mm, that's true. I mean, can you think of another just off the top of your head? Uh, maybe the TV show Firefly to an extent, but yeah. it, was, it, it still balances more in the sci-fi than it does the comedy. Yeah, no, you're right. But uh, yeah, it, 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 it's a genre that doesn't really kind of get exploited all that often, which I find surprising because science fiction is huge. Mm, mm. I, well, I guess you could argue that some of those Star Trek films that we talked about were in the comedy realm. And this and this film firmly has its tongue in its cheek, if you know what I mean. It, it does, it, yeah. You know, like there's so many kind of references and and um, just, I mean, the whole premise is just hilarious. Yeah, and it's never malicious. That's the thing is that it's, it's very heartfelt in... In its parody it's not saying we hate star trek we hate star trek fans so we're going to make fun of you it's you guys are culturally significant and we're going to love lovingly parody you and we think you'll like it oh totally. that's true yeah totally and it's it's like it's, it's always the basis of a really really good comedy is kind of true honesty when you're actually acting it out and you you need to make me as a the audience member believe totally what you're doing however ridiculous it may or may not be and and one, one of the performances for me that actually sticks out in this film is um the leader of the uh the, the therm is it thermians is that right 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think he's. I think is the actor's name is uh, Enrico Colantoni. I think it is, yeah. and he's excellent in it. And he's like he's totally in the role one hundred percent, and he's completely ridiculous, but he's totally honest with his performance. Like you totally buy the fact that he's actually. You know, he really needs this uh, this crew's help, and he believes who these people are, and he he thinks that they can genuinely help his people, even though the show it's just a TV show, yeah. And they keep, they they try to explain it to him a few times, don't they? They do, yeah. Of course, he doesn't understand, so it's it's good how they get around that. But yeah, you know, is. before we get too deep into our yep. main discussion, let's get into a bit of the trivia here. Yes, so it was uh, released um, on December twenty five on Christmas Day in nineteen. 19- 1999 and it was directed by Dean Parasote and Dean Parasote actually he actually didn't do that like he's very much a TV kind of director he did like Northern Exposure The Marshall he went on to direct Fun with Dick and Jane which was wasn't that 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 political no that that was that Jim Carrey film actually yeah the Jim Carrey and um what's the name David Duchovny's wife yes T. Leone Terry learning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he went on to direct that, and he also did a couple of Modern Family episodes, and he did Red 2. Yes, Red 2, I thought, was... Uh... You can see his style in that movie. Yeah, I, I never saw Red One, so I can't really comment. <laughs> Apparently, to be fair, though, I actually heard good things about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think they're both pretty funny films. So. Yeah. Yeah, they get a recommend from me. But, you know, Dean Parasite wasn't the original person they wanted no. For this, originally Harold Ramis was attached to direct this, and he actually ended up leaving because he was kind of forced into hiring or casting Tim Allen in the main role, and he didn't want that, so he he left. He actually wanted Kevin Klein or Alec Baldwin, which are both decent choices. But you know, when I think when a director gets muscled into who he should cast, you can see why they would walk away. I, I like Tim Allen in this role, but I could totally see Alec Baldwin doing it. Yeah, totally. I mean, if you're going for more of a, a Shatner parody, yeah, then both of those guys would do a decent work. Tim Allen, even though he is doing what is supposed to be a Shatner parody, is still going to bring his own thing. Yeah, I kind of, you know, when, whenever Tim Allen acts, I always see Tim the Tall Man Taylor, if you know what I mean. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> A show which uh, I never really paid too much attention to back in the day, but you know what, man? Like, regardless of whether I like that show or not, that that show was on TV a long time. It was Home Improvement. I th- I thought it was funny. I watched yeah. it when I was a kid. I can't I... say I've like revisited it or anything. Like, I didn't buy the box what? sets and do a binge watch or no. anything. But I what watched was, it when it was on. What was the name of the neighbor that you never saw his eyes? Uh, Wilson. Wilson. That's yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. Yeah, and you, and you know, I don't think you ever saw him, did you? Yeah, I think like right to the end, even when the show was ending and they they had him like come over to the house, you know, so he was no longer behind the fence, but they would still find ways to obscure (laughs) the bottom of his face, like there'd be a pile of books right next to him or something. It was really funny. Oh my God. Well, you know, maybe some of our our, our fans and viewers can can confirm that. Yeah. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see. Anyway, the film was uh, very financially successful galaxy quest i should say um it earned seven million on its opening weekend and um its total u.s domestic tally stands at 71 million five hundred eighty three thousand dollars to date and it it actually grossed 90 million uh worldwide well you know seven million dollars on its opening weekend is pretty good considering it came out at christmas yeah totally and like what like its budget was 45 million so it wasn't a small film like even for 1999 that's still that's still a sizable budget it still needs to do well to make its money back yeah i mean it had some pretty complex sets on there and you know some nice special effects that they had to do so yeah it's definitely not a cheap film no and, and like as i said before like even the cast itself would have cost a little bit of money to kind of get to put together i mean it's quite a like all, there's a lot of names in there especially sigourney weaver like i mean she, she's a, she was a big star oh man in 99 i mean she's that's 20 years after Alien. The, at this time, the, Sigourney Weaver's sci-fi royalty. Yeah, and don't Ghostbusters, man. Ghostbusters. How could I forget Ghostbusters? Yeah, I know. No, but you can't. You can't. <laughs> <laughs> of course. But yeah, she really is, you know? So, I mean, she's a get for this movie. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, what else is there, man? Okay, so um, when, the, when the crew are eating on board the ship... And they're told that their food has been prepared based on their regional cuisine. I, lo- I love the drop line because they ask Taggart, 
Jason, they ask him if he is enjoying his food. And he says, oh, man, this steak tastes like Iowa beef. And that's supposed to be like a little drop reference that his character of Taggart is from Iowa, just yeah, yeah, yeah. as James T. Kirk was from Iowa. I thought it was a great little... Yeah, yeah. It's, it, 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 it's, <laughs> an, it's a nice little kind of, you know, hand wave, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And, of course, like, you're really paying attention to what, like, um, Alan Rickman is supposed to be eating, you know, which is, I suppose, I guess, supposed to be, like, a take on, um, well, you always see war feeding, you know, some sort of gross thing. How are you enjoying your steak, Commander? I'm really enjoying it. This is like... Corn-fed Iowa beef. Yes. We programmed the food synthesizer for each of you based on the regional menu of your birthplace. Okay, where you did it. Tastes great. Are you enjoying your Ketmot blood ticks, Dr. Lazarus? Just like mother used to make. So, um, tell me, Mathers, uh, this Saris person that we're flying to meet, what does he want, exactly? He heard about the device. The Omega-13. Um, what is it? What does it do? We don't know. We were hoping you could enlighten us. <laughs> oh, the Omega-13 device. We found that on an alien planet. We don't know what it does either. Well, why don't you just turn it on and see what it does? <laughs> <laughs> it has at its heart a reactor capable of unthinkable energy. If we were mistaken in our construction, the device would act as a molecular explosive, causing a chain reaction that would obliterate all matter in the universe. Has Sarah's ever seen any of the historical records? No, thank God he has not. No. Oh. So, how does he know about the Omega-13 device? Our former commander was not strong. And I actually found this Sam Rock, Rockwell um, fresh from the uh, set of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Sorry, I, oh, I know, right? I, I just had to put that in there. And if you don't, yeah. be, and if you don't believe me, Google it. Sam exactly. Rockwell. Exactly. He's the punk in the Foot Gang that wants to give you cigarettes. <laughs> He is. It's he, awesome. He's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Sam Rockwell uh, actually based his uh, portrayal on Bill Paxton's performance in Aliens. Uh, in, in, can't in, you just say that once you know that trivia? Well, uh, it's funny because I actually I did these notes for the uh, for for this show a couple of days ago, and I, I actually only watched the movie last night and tonight. I did it in two parts, and I kept thinking about Bill Paxton whenever he showed up on st- on screen, and it was totally spot on like he's over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh the scene where tim allen is in the men's room and he overhears the the kids coming out of the convention talking about how he's a total laughing stock that is actually based on a real life event a story that william shatner told of his life when he was at a convention went to the men's room and overheard people saying that i guess he's a bit of a laughing stock can't believe he gets off on all these geeks you know it's it's ridiculous yeah like i mean I'm... I kind of don't really want to read too much into all the whole like political dynamics amongst like the the crews of the Star Treks because I just don't really care that much. But apparently it's true though. Apparently there there's quite a lot of animosity amongst the original crew and they certainly do not get along behind mm. the scenes. It's interesting that you would take a, a true story like that and sort of weave it for the purposes of this film. Um, the themes work really well. Oh, totally. Yeah, 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 and, and and you buy it. You 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 totally understand that this crew is like on this long running kind of TV show, especially like earlier on, like with um Alan Rickman's character, because I think that one of the first things he says in the whole film is, "I once played Richard the Third. Yeah, and and, and he and he's just totally embarrassed by him having to repeat this ridiculous line all the time. You know yeah. what I mean? It makes you think of like uh, I think it's supposed to be like Patrick Stewart or something like that, where you're just like a British proper British actor, and I'm you know resigned to saying from by Grabthar's hammer every day of my life, yeah, and I can't yeah, get yeah. a proper job anymore, which is totally not Patrick Stewart at all. Of course, Patrick Stewart went on to a lot of great roles after Star Trek, but I think that's like where they're coming from with that character. Yeah. So, so um, Tim Allen actually also admitted that he was very starstruck when he met Sigourney weaver as i would be as an I YouTube, know, why, yeah why um, wouldn't you as he's a huge fan of um alien alan actually even got weaver to sign some of his alien merchandise or memorabilia between takes 
<laughs> which I'm not so I'm not surprised at. No, no, I would probably do the same. If I'm if I'm doing a movie with Sigourney Weaver, I'm I'm taking any chance I can get to <laughs> make yeah. Aliens fans jealous. This is Justin Long's film debut. Yes, along with Rain Wilson. I know. If I'm... you saw him in there. Yep, yep, yep. I think Missy Pyle. This is one of her very early kind of uh, roles as well. So, yeah, it could be. So, so I mean, I mean I, whenever I think of Missy Pyle, I always kind of think of... She was in Charlie and the Chocolate... Like Tim Burton's Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And um, she was also in the most recent David Fincher film, um, Gone Girl. She, That's right, yeah. She, yeah, she was like the, uh, the, the, the crazy... Um, not crazy, but just the very southern kind of news reporter. Yeah. Wasn't she? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Anyway. She was also in Josie and the Pussycats, if you remember. Was that. she? Oh yeah, man, I totally forgot one with about Rachel Lee Cook. It. Yeah, nice. So, <laughs> so it kind of had her in it. Had Justin Long. I think Justin Long does pretty well. And you know, I think it's pretty interesting actually when you look at Justin Long's performance in this film and his his acting style hasn't changed all that much. It's, it's true, but you know, I, I still think even though he's such a small part of it, I mean, he gets the a, a bit more screen time towards the end of the movie, but. His characterization of, of a typical sci-fi show geek is, it's over the top, sure, but it's still kind of dead on. And, and speaking of cameos in this film, and I actually know only knows this tonight, but the mum of Justin Long's character, Justin Long's character is a guy named Brandon, and uh, the mum is Heidi, Heidi Swedberg, who, who was actually Susan in Seinfeld. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't even pay that much attention. Yeah, yeah, I kind of, I saw it, and I was like, you look really familiar, so I Googled it straight away. I just kind of, <laughs> I, I just kind of went, Brandon's mum, Galaxy Quest, and sure enough, it was Susan from Seinfeld, and I went, there you nice, go. there you go. All right, uh, another bit here. Sigourney Weaver said that uh, whenever she puts on the blonde wig to play Gwen. She says, uh, I could feel my IQ drop precipitously. I, th- I think her role in this film is hilarious. I think she, I know. The I think boobs, the hair. The boobs, and just, and just the, uh, the whole concept of her, the only thing her character has to do is to repeat what the computer says. Exactly. Like, the computer says it in techno babble, and then she sort of just simplifies it and repeats. <laughs> That's all she does, and there's she a couple, and there's a couple of like references throughout the film, like of uh, please stop doing that, and she's like, this is the only thing I have to do. Don't take it away from me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, at the end of the movie, just before the opening credits for the new Galaxy Quest series, the announcer actually says, "Now back after 18 years, the new adventures at Galaxy Quest." The original Star Trek was actually. Um, debuted in 66 but was cancelled in 69 and star trek the next generation debuted in 1987 which also meant it was 18 years later so again we, we've got like a bit of a sly reference to star trek yeah i love it yeah it's great when you you know it's just little things like that you know they don't explain it but if you're really onto star trek then you're going to pick up these little references i I think i read as well that tim allen did a lot of studying of captain kirk and and like how he kind of sat in the chair Mm. and and whatnot and tried to mimic him a a little bit but but even if you look at the way the bridge is set up like the where everyone's sitting is very similar to like star trek and whatnot like it's it, it just looks really similar doesn't it does yeah yeah they're they're, they're definitely going for the same thing they're trying to make you think of star trek deliberately uh, yeah a lot of areas i I do think though that tim allen plays the role of captain taggart or jason nesmith probably a touch more campy than perhaps kirk did in the original star trek because like 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 Tim Allen's got like this kind of long hair. Like he's obviously very, very vain in the TV show, if you know what I mean. Yeah, exactly. It's it's like I said. Like he he does have to play two characters ostensibly. Each each of the cast has to play two characters because they're playing the actors and then they're playing the characters in the TV show as yeah. well. So they've got to walk that fine line a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. Just quickly too, before we get to our main story, um, or our main discussion, I should say, is talk, there's been talks of a sequel has been going on since the film's release in 99, but only began gaining traction in 2014 when um, Tim Allen actually mentioned that there was a script. Stars Weaver and Rockwell mentioned that they were interested in returning. However, Colin Tony had stated that he would prefer for there not to be a sequel lest it tarnish the characters from the first film he said to make something up just because we love these characters and turn it into a sequel then it becomes the awful sequel yeah it's a tough call it's interesting that he of all people would say that i mean he hasn't gone on to too much 
in his career, Colin Tony. Yeah, I, I kind of, I don't, yeah, I kind of, I don't know if there's a really, really solid sequel f- to this. I mean, as I said, we'll get more into it into our main discussion because the way the film ends, it, it, it's very, it does kind of wrap it up into a neat little bow almost, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It's, it's You're right, like, where would they go with a sequel? I mean, it ended with the show coming back. That's so exactly right. What are you going to do? It's like, what, the Thermians is going to come back and ask them to do it again? Yeah, maybe. Right. maybe. Yeah, I don't know. Anyway, there's um, apparently, well, he, there's actually some more to it too. In April 2015, um, along with the movie's co-writer Gordon, um, director Parasol and executive producer Johnson and Bernstein announced that they were looking to develop a television series based on Galaxy Quest. Um, the movie actually is considered in a similar vein to, as Paramount's current revivals of Minority Report and School of Rock as television series. And it was actually announced in August 2015, which is only a few months ago, that um, Amazon Studios would actually be developing the series. So it sounds like we're going to be seeing something on our TV screens. And in in some ways, I kind of hope they reboot it rather than kind of reimagine what the, the film did. Yeah, exactly. It, it's the Vogue thing to do, really, these days, is to take something that was really good and sort of retool it in a new format. And it, usually it's like Netflix or, yeah, Amazon, putting it into a, a TV series for web streaming, which, you know, I, I, I'd be interested. I'd watch that. Yes, yeah, 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 definitely. So, yeah, if they do it the right way, then there are more stories to tell, and it could work in that format. So, um, yeah. I'm kind of looking forward to a TV version of it, maybe not a film sequel. Exactly, exactly. All right. Well, shall we get into our main discussion? Yes. Okay, so the film opens and we get a scene from Galaxy Quest. And it turns out that we're watching this at a fan convention. And it's pretty much how the show ended on this cliffhanger. He talks about... You know, they're in a dire situation. The ship is crashing. We need the Omega-13. Yep. And then the episode ends and we're at this convention. You know, I think it's a cool way to start because the Omega-13 doesn't come back until like way, way later. Yeah. So they just drop it here at the beginning. They do mention it a few times throughout the film and it's almost like a... You could tell that it's going to be something important towards the end of the movie. Yeah, but it's it's an interesting thing to sort of lay into how this movie itself is going to play out. Is that there's this Omega-13, but we have no idea what it is because the show was cancelled. It yes. was never developed or anything like that. So when it comes back later and they tie it into fan theories and stuff like that, yeah, 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 it's yeah. very yeah, it's it's very sci-fi fandom. Oh, totally. And, like, it's kind of interesting to see, like, the backstage of the convention because the whole it, – it starts with, you're right, you, you open up at the convention, they, they, you see the final scene of, of, of whatever episode it was and they talk about the Omega-13, as you say. But then they kind of go backstage and you've got all the stars, like, of the TV show, in particular Rickman talking about Richard the Third and Tony Shalhoub, who plays a really kind of curious character in this as well. But also there's a guy named Tommy Mitchell or Tommy Weber, I should say say who's played by a guy named daryl mitchell who was kid pilot on the on the on the original <laughs> tv show but he's obviously yeah. he's obviously grown up now like he was like his 10 year old kind of pilot wasn't he yeah which is really funny because when they do it here you're just like why in the hell is this kid the pilot in this show <laughs> that's right but then you think uh wesley crusher well, yeah that's right piloted the uh, the enterprise <laughs> here and there so that's not too far off but with wesley like they brought in this whole thing about how he was a genius and he wasn't actually the pilot of the enterprise he sort of just showed up sometimes yeah but but it, i mean the premise is it establishes very very quickly that um these people this is all they've got like that this tv show was huge back in the day um i could get the impression maybe some of them are acting in various other things but they're certainly not very successful this is the only really successful thing they they really kind of grabbed onto and it hammers at home quite hard that they have to work together to kind of you know have a future and make money because they don't they say once or twice they get upset don't they because they realize that uh jason is starting to do gigs by himself yeah yeah, it seems that you know, going by how he reacts later with the Thermians, how they, they take him in to have that meeting with Saris, it seems like what he's doing is that he lets geeks come and hire him to, 
I guess, role play or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's supposed to be like LARPing or something like that. And these people can hire him, they can pay him, and he'll come in and pretend to be the commander of their ship or whatever and make some extra money on the side that way. Yeah, yeah, and totally. yeah. And of course, everybody's upset with him because he was the commander in the show. So I guess he, he feels like he has this stature that he's the leader of what they're doing here. And everybody else is just like, we have to do this because this is how we make money and we're not getting any other acting roles. So we have to keep doing this or we're, you know, we're going to be poor. This is great. You know, usually it's just cardboard walls in a garage. Sir, we apologize oh. for operating oh. in low power mode, but we are experiencing a hmm, reflective flux field this close to the galactic axis. You know what I could use is a cup holder and a couple of Advil. We're approaching in five ticks, sir. Command to slow. Uh, set it on screensaver two. <laughs> you know, you get a, uh, oh, I'm sorry to break uh, the, the, the mood here. Um, slow it down to mark two, Lieutenant. I see fear. That is expected. Mm-hmm. Ah, they bring a new commander. That's good. Here That's good. are I mean, my you know, it looks. Demands. And if I do not hear what I like, Real. then there will be blood and pain, mm. as you cannot imagine. First, ah, I require the Omega 13. Second, oh. I will require a technician. Okie dokie, okie dokie. Uh, let's fire blue particle cannons full, red particle cannons full, gannet magnets, fire them left and right, and let them run all shoot them while you're at it once. Yeah, toss that at him, killer. That should take care of old lobster head, shouldn't it? <laughs> So 18 years after the show was cancelled at the Galaxy Quest convention, which is full of dedicated fans, Jason is actually approached by a group of people who say that they are Thermians from the Klaatu Nebula. And, um, of course, Jason kind of looks at them and kind of rolls his eyes a little bit, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He he thinks it's just another one of these gigs. He sort of palms them off and just says, you know, make sure I've got a limo or something. Yeah, as well. that's exactly I thought it was right. great. Like, it's like the last time I did this, they sent a station wagon. I was like, eh. yeah, get in touch with my agent and do this, and you know, sort out all the details with him, kind of thing. You know, exactly. And they all, you know, go to do their signings, of course, and and again like all the other actors are there and they're just like you know sign this sign this sign this jason actually goes with them to what he assumes will be like an amateur filming session as you mentioned earlier but the uh, the thermians really are aliens which he doesn't realize at the time um they're actually kind of like like they've they disguise themselves haven't they like that they appear like human type form they wear these kind of like silver kind of one piece kind of outfits but they're, they've they're clearly disguised their true identity which is like this octopus kind of style yeah yeah but before we get too deep in with them i mean we do have the scene where uh jason overhears these punks oh, yeah. talking about That's him right. yeah, of course. Like he gets upset he ends up lashing out at one of his fans which is brandon played by justin long because <laughs> doesn't he show up and kind of ask him some like ridiculous engineering question about like a really like specific episode and how they 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 went down this one sh- you know shaft but if you look at the uh at the at the blueprints it doesn't make any sense and all that kind of stuff exactly like he was he's he is in the minutia of the show yeah, well, him and and he wants an explanation it? to why there's this inconsistency. And Jason just blows up at him. Gets him it's a damn show. Leave me alone. Yeah, it's not real. You know, yeah. get, get a life kind of thing. You know? So he ends up you know, just drinking himself till he passes out. And of course the Thermians show up again That's the right. next morning. That's exactly right. At his place. And yeah, I, I love how they're talking to him and he's like misinterpreting what they're saying because they're like, you know, we, we know this is a breach in protocol. And he's like, yeah, 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 I get it. You shouldn't have come to my house. <laughs> and, they, and they plead with him to help him don't they plead yes yes and, they, and, and, they have to come and help and, us. and and like jason clearly doesn't understand the, the gravity of, of what they're really asking for does he exactly because they they have got a limo because he told them to get a limo for us. <laughs> That's right. and they drive it along and he's just like you know i'm you know i'm just gonna close my eyes but i'm listening to everything you say so just keep talking <laughs> Is, isn't there a scene too when they're in the house and he's like maybe i should put some pants on you know it's, yeah <laughs> Find a sh- find the other shoe that looks like this, and they're like looking up on the ceiling and stuff. 
it's really right. funny. It's very, it's very subtle, just how these these guys are playing the aliens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the big, I mean, the big catch about this film is that the the, uh, the Thermians there are they're very technologically advanced, but they don't have any concept of fiction because their their big thing is that they have mistaken broadcasts of Galaxy Quest for historical documentaries and have uh, actually modelled their society on the ethos presented in the show. So their way of life is is, is totally based around the characters that these actors are playing and and um the act like you know tim allen that they, they don't really know how to take it do they well you know it's a great idea because you know in reality um just like justin long brandon <laughs> is into the minutia of the show these aliens have looked at this like it's fact yeah that's right and they have garnered all the stuff that the fandom has has got you know, so they the only difference is that these aliens can actually build this stuff and not just, you know, create specs of the ship and put it online and say, you know, buy all these episodes, this is how the ship is laid out and everything like this. So, you know, it's a, it's a great idea that these aliens have actually gone ahead and made this stuff. And now these actors <laughs> have been brought up there because they think, like, they can help them. You guys are the crew. Uh, you always, you know, win the day. They've got to deal with everything that happened in the show and they've got to deal with it in that way. You know, they can't think about it logically. They, <laughs> they need to, to work the ship the way that it worked in the show. Yeah, that's, it. that's, it. that's exactly right. And they, and they base themselves on, on the way that they kind of uh, control things. Like, and we'll talk about it later, but there's a scene with the engineer, which is Tony Shalhoub's character, and you can so tell he's just totally out of his depth. <laughs> <laughs> you know? But they're in awe, aren't they? Like, like, as, like, do you remember what we were talking about before about the idea of honesty in acting? Like, the, the aliens really do believe leave it don't they so you, you do you take like even though it's funny and totally ridiculous you take it seriously from, from a narrative perspective perspective and you, you kind of you, you take it on board and you accept the situation and you move forward it's it's hilarious it's great yeah well even the development of that is is pretty realistic because i mean they come up and they're faced with the reality that sure all this stuff has been made from our tv show and these aliens don't believe that it's not real they still sort of need to come around to actually figuring in their own heads that what they are doing actually has real world effect. Yeah, yeah. In yeah, a way. Yeah. Because it starts off like, you know, it will, you know, first Jason had that encounter with Saris and he's just like, you know, blue torpedoes and red torpedoes. There we go. All, all, <laughs> that's it. I'm out of here. But when they face off with him again, they end up, like, damaging the ship, like, really bad. Well, they damage the ship because he's not really taking it seriously at that stage, exactly. is he? Exactly. So, you know, that sort of gets them to the point where they're on this, this planet. They need more beryllium for the core. Yeah. And they go to this planet, and there's these little pixie aliens there. And then there's this rock monster and everything. It sort of makes them realize that what they're doing is reality. And, it, and, and it's impacting this race of aliens, you know. And it's, it's not even until after that that they realize that these Thermians that are on the ship, that's, that's all that's left. Yeah, that, that's their race. And it takes them a while to kind of get there. And, and basically the Thermians transport Jason onto the Protector and negotiate with Saris. And then um, after kind of that occurs, they, he somehow ends up back on Earth to kind of persuade the rest of the actors to, to, to that there's actually something real happening and, and I need your help. So he goes back to Earth and he takes a while to persuade the rest of the gang because they do, doesn't um, they show up and aren't they at some opening of some electronics yeah yeah kind <laughs> it's of like, store it's my like, opening opening line there with uh, Alan Rickman yes <laughs> I grew up with those from uh, water show rooms <laughs> <laughs> which is great it's uh, great it's, a, it's another little thing that's set up in the beginning you know not only is his character totally not happy with his lot in life but he has said this line so many times everybody just wants it you know even even at the fan convention like all the geeks come up to him and say it and he's just like oh 
How really? many times a day do I need to hear this and say this? But yeah, so so they they uh, they show up at the electronics thing, and then they uh, he kind of persuade. They're all they're all angry at Jason too because he's a no show at this thing too, isn't he? Yeah, he's late. <laughs> he's he's really late, so they get angry at him really quickly, and it takes them a while to kind of persuade. I think the I think the Thermians kind of show up and do some gentle persuading to actually get them to kind of uh, come up to the protector, um, which is orbiting who knows where and they're like they're somehow kind of taking them from earth and putting them onto the ship via some kind of tube through space almost yeah i thought that was actually a really great effect i liked it too i thought you know what 1999 there's a, there's a lot of cgi in this film tons of yeah, it. yeah like the, the the whole jelly thing coming up and protecting them as they fly through space and <laughs> even just the reaction to it you know the the, the sheer shock yeah they just can't even move after they've <laughs> gotten back to where they are. Really funny stuff. So, so when this kind of crew who somehow are like, I mean, let's, let, let's be honest for a second. This is a fish out of water story, isn't it? Totally. The, yeah. The, 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 this is these people that are totally ill-equipped to handle a situation. They're thrown in the deep end and they have to somehow kind of navigate their way through a bit of a minefield to actually win and actually beat the enemy. But like, I think it's hilarious too, man, because when they get onto the protector, that's when Sam Rockwell's character really starts venting and getting... <laughs> And he's hilarious, man, because he's, he's like, man, I'm crewman number six. Like, I'm expendable. I'm the guy that shows up to, to make a distraction or do something. And, and he just gets killed off really quickly. And he's, it's, it's like his through line for the rest of the film, isn't it? Is him kind of convinced that he's going to get killed really quickly because that's his role. Yeah, yeah. And not to mention that his name's Guy. <laughs> that, that's it. He's just Guy. <laughs> And, um, you know, it's, it's a take on the red shirt, right? You know, just uh, everybody knows the Star Trek red shirt. You know, he's the guy in the red shirt who goes with you. Yeah, he's the one that's going to die. Yeah, None of the main yeah. cast is going to die. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the guy that all of a sudden has dialogue that you've never heard before. <laughs> it's like, who's that guy? Yeah, and like we'll say it in the trivia, like he says, Sam Rockwell said that he based the character on Hudson from Alien. And he's like, yes, exactly. Like, even though, like, well, Hudson wasn't like a red shirt character, but his, the way he portrays this character is very Hudson-esque, you know, mm -hmm. just freaking out about everything. When they're going down onto the planet to get the beryllium, and he's talking about how his character, what was my character's last name? My character wasn't important enough to have <laughs> that's exactly, that's that's exactly number right. six. Um, and then they open the, the door. It's just like, you can't do that. Is there air out there? You don't know. Yeah. What's going on? <laughs> that's exactly what. He chews up the scenery. <laughs> Every oh, time he starts freaking out and doing his bit, he's like, he's stealing it, man. He's stealing the scene. But I, I do like the, the there's a line later in the film from Tony Shalhoub to the uh, Sam Rockwell character guy I should say, and um, he actually says to him and again this is like a couple of minutes before the end he goes did you ever think for a second that you might be comic relief <laughs> and it's so true it's like like for this whole film because he's like man I'm I'm crewman number six man I didn't have a name I, I wasn't important to have a last name it's hilarious and uh, yeah and, and Tony Shalhoub just kind of convinces him that you might be just comic relief yeah. Trying to say that he's he's not the character he thinks he is. Yeah, that's right. And so, Tony Shalhoub, man. I mean, what's he doing in this movie? <laughs> Throughout the thing, it seems like he's like high or something. Like he's just like been smoking weed the whole time or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's something, there's something a bit off about his character, isn't it? And I, I think it's something that's clearly off, if you know what I mean. Like, um, because they allude to it a few times when I think there's this that scene when Tim Allen or Cap Captain Taggart is kind of down on the ground and they're trying to transport them out and they they get back to the protector and they go, well, has the protector has they have you ever used this before? And he goes, well, theoretically it's possible, but but we've never actually tested it. And then and then um they go, well, since you know Tony Shalhoub's character is actually here, he should actually do it. You know what I mean? And you can tell that he's the shit scared shitless about it because they've they've modelled everything on literally like the actions in the TV show. So they just assume that that is the correct way of doing things. Yeah, yeah. And of course he, he beams up like the little, what, what do they call it? like a pig lizard or something like that. And it, it comes in inside out. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> so you're right. Whatever he did, 
you're not doing it right. You just, you just remember your performance and move your hands how you would in the show. That's right. But thankfully, upon the second attempt, when he tries to get um, Captain Taggart out of that hairy situation, he succeeds, doesn't he? Just at the last second. Like, it's literally at the last second. Yeah, and they play that joke a couple of times, so, you know, just when they're taking the ship out as well. Yeah. There's like, well, you know, they based the, the piloting controls on how, how you moved your heads. And, of course, he sort of just starts veering to the left and starts yeah. scraping along the port as they go out. That's right. <laughs> so, the um, as we said, the, the actors are not competent at controlling a real spaceship and their encounter with Saris actually goes really poorly. They escape by flying through a minefield, which actually damages the beryllium sphere that powers the ship's uh, reactor. The actors actually require a new sphere from a nearby planet after, and after battling various alien creatures, they actually return to the ship and actually provide new beryllium to actually get the ship back up and running again. But by the time they've got it back up and running, Saris has actually boarded the ship and actually taken control. And Saris actually questions Jason about the Omega-13 and forces him to admit the truth about Galaxy Quest. It's actually a pretty good scene, actually. I didn't mind it. Yeah, you know, this whole beat of the film, it prepares them for what they have to do yeah. in a way, you know? They, they have to go down to that planet and encounter aliens again guy is freaking out like he's like oh you know yeah they look like children but if we go over there something bad's gonna happen yeah that's right and then immediately they, they they're like cannibals and they're just eating another injured alien <laughs> yeah, the face is, is, isn't rocking. there isn't there that scene when they're on the planet as well and they kind of go we've got to come up with a plan like we've got to create a diversion and and they and they, they talk to the uh the uh the pilot the the, the child star and he goes oh i'll i'll, 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 I'll give you a signal and it's like cuckoo cuckoo car or something like that and tim allen just looks at him and says what are you a child like <laughs> <laughs> we have these communicators yeah, you know, we, they that's, work. E that's exactly right we have these communicators they work you can use them it's fine <laughs> Very funny. And then, you know, they, they take off on autopilot. So Jason gets left behind and he has to face off against this rock monster. Yeah. And um, his shirt gets torn off while they're fighting. <laughs> and Gordy Weaver looks at him and he says, oh, any reason to get your shirt off? Which is Kirk in the original series all over. Just whenever he was in a fight with an alien, somehow his shirt would get torn yeah, I know, off. Which is just random and weird, isn't it? Yeah. So great little touch. Great yeah, little touch. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so Saris is actually asking Jason about the Omega-13 and actually forces him to admit the truth about that Galaxy Quest is just a TV show, we are just actors. And he tries to explain this to Mathisar, who's the leader of the Thumians. Keep in mind, Mathisar is actually getting tortured by Saris at this stage. And uh, Saris actually forces Jason to tell him this. And he explains it to Mathisar, and he doesn't understand. And then Matt Saris actually says to him, you need to tell him like a child. And he goes, yeah. and, and then he starts saying to him that um, we are just deceivers. We're, you know, I'm just an actor. I'm not a hero at all. And uh, Mathisar kind of freaks out a little bit, doesn't he? Yeah, it's an interesting idea that this race has no concept of lying. When Jason starts to explain what actors are, that, you know, we just make pretend and stuff like that, he says, oh, yeah, we sort of came to know this concept a little bit while we're on Earth. It's called deception. Yeah, so he yeah, relates yeah. it to a really bad thing, deception, lying. This isn't good. So he's actually pretty devastated by the whole thing. It's a, it's a pretty good scene. I mean, it's pretty full on with Saris torturing him and everything and the fact that they need to sort of let them know what's actually going on here. Yes. So after that all happens, Cyrus's men actually activate the ship's self-destruct, but Jason and Alexander actually use a premise from one of the old TV shows to actually, they, they, they stage like a fight. Yeah, but instead of just like staging a fight, it really is like letting out their frustrations about each other yeah. and calling each other a hack. Yeah. You, or you, wannabe. you scene stealer. That's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 yeah. All that kind of shit. It was a pretty good scene though, but... uh. I mean, I I, th I think this film does suffer a little bit from movie logic a bit. We just kind of, I mean, the, the enemies are pretty stupid, aren't they? Well, yeah, yeah. At the same time, I think they're supposed to be. Jason calls Saris lobster head because he's got like these claw things coming out of the top of his head or something. And he's like, yeah, you know, there's really, their physiology doesn't make much sense, but there's a lot of races in Star Trek that there, just There's tons, weird. I know. So after they um, somehow thwart the self-destruct, um, and actually there's a really good scene actually when they're in the self-destruct because um, 
not knowing how the ship works, Jason actually contacts an avid Galaxy Quest fan named Brandon, who we spoke about before, which is Justin Long's character, in his suburban home on Earth, using one of the Thermian's communicators that he accidentally swapped at a promotional store opening. Brandon and his friends use their extensive knowledge of the ship to help Jason and Gwen abort the self-destruct. And this is great too, you know, they come across the Omega-13, they find that it was built... They just don't know what it is, what it does, because that was never explained in the show. Well, this is when it kind of comes back to, into play, isn't it? Because you, yeah. you're right, it kind of got mentioned earlier on, but then it kind of comes back here as well. Yeah. And, uh, and they kind of hypothesize what it could kind of do. And, and I think Brandon explains that he, you know, some people believe that the Omega-13 bomb is a bomb capable of destroying all matter in the universe and and some some other pe people think it's a time machine and, and it sends its users 13 seconds into the past, enough time to redeem a single mistake, as Jason ad observes. Yeah, I thought this was really good, you know, just the fact that there was this thing, it was never explained because the show was cancelled, so there's just all these fan theories out there to what it could actually do, but we don't know. Brandon's helping them get through the ship, which is needlessly complicated, <laughs> and, by the way. Yeah, yeah this is clamp. They call them the clampers or something like that. And it's just a room where these bars bash into each other and flames throw up everywhere. <laughs> That's exactly right. Keep in mind when they're so this is going back a little bit when they're actually getting rid of the self destruct sequence. They go, "You got to hit the blue button to um <laughs> to uh, to like stop it." And he goes, "Really? I thought it'd be a little bit more complicated than that." And they hit. The the blue button and they hit it several times and it's not working and then and then it counts down and it just stops at one yeah. and Sigourney Weaver goes it always stops at one in these shows you know? it's really funny that they uh, the Thermians would take the idea that it has to stop at one like if you're going to cancel it it still needs to stop at one because it always just stops at one yeah, <laughs> hilarious oh it's, very, it's, very, it's really very good but yeah you're right it's it's needlessly complicated and um brandon um is getting it like he jumps on the internet doesn't he in 1999 he jumps on the internet and he's talking to his friends he goes get everyone online now there's yeah there's, there's like a, a crisis that we need to deal with right now it was funny like when he first got in contact with jason He's just like, it's me, it's the captain. And he says, oh, you know, I know you yelled at me and look, I'm not a weirdo. I know it's just a show or anything like that. And he goes, no, 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 we're up here right now and we need your help. And he's like, I knew it. I knew everything was real. It had to be. <laughs> and he gets everybody, the whole community together. The captain needs our help. And everyone's like coming together to help him. You know what, man? Like it's, really it's, it's, well, no, it's no surprise that Justin Long garnered some attention from this film like if this is his first feature and, and like he went on to like a a reasonably successful career and he's still making films like really good films to this day like he was really quite good in this film like he, he plays the geek character really well yeah i love that they they sort of do a subversion of what happened to the crew uh you know with the whole thing about how you know they just thought that they, the thermians were just geeks and stuff like that and then as he's running out of the house to go and like pilot help help them pilot the ship in by letting off bottle rockets his his mother turns around and she says you know what are you doing and he goes oh you know the the protectors up in space and they're, you know, they're going to crash land and we're going to help them land and use these <laughs> bottle rockets as guides and stuff like that and the mother's just like oh okay well have fun yeah that's it doesn't she say like dinners at seven make sure yeah. you're home by then so it's the same sort of thing, you know, instead of like aliens, too many, it's like juxtaposing scenarios into this geek's life. It's, it's pretty funny. That's right. So, so with Jason in command of the protector, the actors and the Thermians actually destroy Saris's ship and set course back to Earth. They actually do it. Don't they go through a minefield and they have some mines behind them? They're magnetic. So they run the ship fast enough. So they will pull towards the ship, but the ship will sort of drag them at Saris's ship. In yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, yeah, and like, Saris is, like, he's being all, like, gung-ho, isn't he? He's like, I could, you know, crush you like a like an ant and, and you would be torn apart like paper and, and saying all these, like, really big things. And then out of nowhere, Jason goes, yeah, yeah, well, you know, I've, I've got mines behind me and he lets them go and before you know it, they're all dead, aren't they? But, but just before his ship explodes, an energy pattern left the ship yes lest we forget the omega 13 
That's right. Sarah shows up on the bridge and just kills everybody. And Jason has to activate the Omega-13 in the hopes that the fan, fan theories are correct. Yes. And travel 13 seconds back in time to stop the attack, which he does with oh. the help of Mathazar, who has shown back up, who I, I think it's, it's funny that Mathazar comes onto the bridge and, and, you know, he sort of thinks about what Jason had said to him and goes, oh, no, <laughs> I knew you were the commander. The ship was this big. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, he was yeah. really good. But, yeah, you know, Jason saves the day, and Mathazar comes in, and he uh, sort of gets his uh, kick in on Saris as well. Oh, totally. And yeah, Jason yeah. makes him the commander. He says, look, you don't need me, but they've got a perfectly good commander here, which I thought was a great way to sort of end that little story arc there. <laughs> So the course phone, Commander? Can you do that? Oh, yeah, it's just point and click. But we're going to have to go through the black hole, though. Any objections? <laughs> All right, set her up. What's the matter, Mathis, huh? We were hoping you could come with us. But my people have no commander. Mathis, I think your people have a great commander. That's right. All right, Tommy, take us into the black hole. We're out! We're going home. Systems register functional. All systems are working, Commander. But the reality is, though, they do need a better commander, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the arc that the Thermians don't need them, that they have all yes. this technology, that That's they can exactly just right. they they can do it themselves. They, they can, can do fight it themselves. themselves. Yeah, 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 yeah. They've just got to kind of think outside the box a little bit more. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and that's basically the end of the film, isn't it? Yeah, they crash down into the convention center of all places. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Merge it to all the fans. Yeah, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Of course, Jason gets in one last shot on Saris. Yep. <laughs> which is great, saves the day. Yep. And then the show is renewed. The show is renewed <laughs> 18 years later, and they're back in action for new adventures. Again, I thought it was a really funny way to, to end the show. Just and like, the movie. Just like Next Generation in 1987 or 86, mm. 87? 87, yeah. I think. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, it, it, so so yeah, so so. Cut a long story short, we loved this movie. I, I thought it was, I thought it was great. Completely agree. Very very lovingly done. You know, it, it, a lot of fan service. Uh, never do you feel like they are, are, are being malicious towards the fans or anything. It really is just a a love letter to to sci fi fans, and it's done so well, pitch perfect. Yeah, totally. And um, yeah, as I said, man, I hope they don't do a sequel because otherwise it might have might ended up like Ghostbusters too. <laughs> hey, I like it. I, I like I like it too. I shouldn't say that. I like it too. <laughs> okay, so um, ratings recommend. Like, what do you reckon? Oh, this is a strong recommend. Absolutely. Like, if you're a science fiction fan of Star Wars, Star Trek, Battlestar Galactica, all those kind of uh, shows, then this is totally up your alley. Firefly as well. Like, it's it's totally the same tone, and and it, it's all about going on an adventure. And even though they they are kind of making they're poking fun, but it's done in a really sincere kind of way that doesn't it doesn't make you feel little or or anything like that. It's it's, it's a really fun film, and it's really well made really well acted even though i could see kevin klein or alec, alec, um, alec baldwin or whoever else harold ramus had in his mind um i'm kind of glad they went with tim allen i think he's quite good in it and um yeah yeah like it's, it's a great film as i said man it's a strong recommend for me yeah i'm there with you strong recommend for this film uh you know that we love star trek so if you're, you're a biggest fan of 
Star Trek as we are, then um, yeah, you got to see this movie. It's I, it's a must for any Star Trek fan. I'm going to give this nine Thermians. Yeah, I, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm going to give it about nine. It's that good. Yeah, it really is. So I'm really glad we kind of got a chance to rewatch it, and um, I'm looking forward to kind of getting into our next series rewatch, which will be uh, in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, absolutely. But uh, do we want to throw out a who said this? I, I think we have to. We keep keep throwing those out. I, th- I think we have to. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, we'll keep this game going. Yeah, it's fun. You know what, man? I'm, I'm looking at the quote now. I know exactly who said it, <laughs> and I, I gave the game away earlier in the episode. So, <laughs> so, 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 listen in. Yeah. Yeah. Give me a count in. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Scene. My character isn't important enough to have a last name because I'm gonna die five minutes in. No. Nice. <laughs> so if you think you know who said that, you know, you can hit us on Twitter using the hashtag rewatch quote or send us your feedback, hit it's us not, up on the Facebook page, all that it, stuff. It's not Bill Paxton from Aliens, is it? Game over, man. Game. My character doesn't have a last name. Man, he's so quotable, isn't he, in that <laughs> film? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next week, next week, I think, are, are we going to kick off our we're gonna Police try, Academy we're, rewatch? We're, we're going to try next week. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we're going to start next week. So, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting for my box set to show up. Ah, yes. And when that shows up, it's going to be all systems go. Awesome. Yeah, no, I'm pretty, we're pretty sure. Yeah, definitely. We'll just say our next episode, at least. <laughs> if it's not next week, it'll be in the very, very near future and we'll be kicking that off with the first police academy movie so looking seven, forward to it seven films in total yes can't wait <laughs> I'm, actually, I'm, I'm actually really looking forward to it it's been it's been forever since i've watched them <laughs> and it's been all too soon since i've watched them so <laughs> yeah, i know i know we'll get into that more yeah, yeah. so um that's it for this episode of the rewatch podcast uh keep up with listener interaction by joining our facebook page at facebook.com forward slash rewatch podcast follow the show on twitter at rewatch pod and visit our web page rewatch Com. And remember, you can always write us an email or record a voice message and send it to the Rewatch Podcast at gmail.com. Also, if you've enjoyed the show, please consider giving us a rate and review on iTunes. It's always very helpful, helps uh, put us up in the iTunes ratings, helps yep. people find the show easier, and builds up all that listener interaction and uh, feedback that we love to hear. Also, uh, I do want to remind you that we are on patreon as well if you can head over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast you can help support us here at the rewatch podcast i mean there are certain costs involved with podcasting you know as you put out more and more episodes hosting costs tend to go up and it's not breaking the bank but if you could spare a dollar a month hundred dollars a month we'd accept that that'd be awesome (laughs) that'd be great totally yeah but you know it just sort of it would help us keep the lights on around here and help us cover some of those hosting costs as we uh move forward and get into more series so if you really enjoy it and you just want to help us out throw a dollar or two dollars or a hundred dollars our way we'd very much appreciate it thanks everyone all right all right Ethan, thanks for joining me. No, thank you so much, man. It's been fantastic. I mean, Star Trek where you watch eleven films in a row. It was and eleven. It was more. It was more than that, wasn't it? It was more than eleven. I have to check that. Yeah, it might have uh, been twelve. Of course, we want to come back and discuss Star Trek Beyond when, uh, whenever that comes out. Yeah, so. well, well, you know what? And and this is a bit of a hint, hint nudge, nudge. We, we should discuss the trailer. Mm. Yeah, we'll talk about that later. Yeah. We might be putting together another different podcast Maybe. somewhere. We'll see. All right. Well, until next time, I'll say never give up, never surrender. How good is that line? It's great, isn't it? I'm just jazzed about being on the show, man. The Rewatch podcast is not associated with the copyright holders of these films and no copyright infringement is intended. The use of any and all copyrighted material is only for parody, news analysis, critique, or educational purposes as provided in Title 17, a.k.a. Fair Use. Music provided by Kevin McLeod and Incompetech.com. Copyright 2016, The Rewatch Podcast. Hi, Rewatch Podcast listeners. I'm Corey. I'm Tom. And I'm Nathan. 
first off, let me say that we have all had a blast doing the Rewatch podcast. Every week, we put out another episode for free for you. And although we enjoy these discussions with each other, we truly do this for you guys out there in podcast land. That's right, Corey. But we are here today to tell you about Patreon. Every week, there are costs involved in podcasting about film and television, including hosting and bandwidth charges, our own personal internet usage, and film or show rentals and purchases. So we're asking you to become a Patreon supporter. If you can afford as little as $1 to throw our way per month, it would really help us keep the lights on. And if you want to send $100 our way every month, we wouldn't turn that down either. But it's your choice, and we appreciate the support you bring. As always, we strive to bring you the best quality shows we can create and we hope that you enjoy them so head on over to patreon.com slash rewatch podcast to become one of our patrons and show your support for the rewatch podcast and if we get enough patrons we may even be able to produce exclusive content just for the supporters in the form of simply getting episodes before the main feed release or even bonus film discussion episodes as a thank you for your support the website again is patreon.com slash rewatch podcast. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>